have a well-functioning and a free and spirited and 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 successful um, free society and 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 and, and successful self-government. I think the Tea Parties actually are sort of onto that when they talk about the Constitution. I mean, what is the Constitution? It's a kind of comprehensive account of how government should work. And when people, the left always makes fun of the Tea Party people for being simple-minded, allegedly, about the Constitution. But the notion of constitutionalism is a is the right kind. Of res a restoration of constitutionalism is the right kind, I would say, of comprehensiveness in terms of the agenda, as opposed to the more familiar uh, liberal progressive welfare state comprehensiveness. Practically, I think what that means is it ends up being sequential. I mean, if you're in opposition uh, or trying to s stop something a bad big change from happening of the nature that we've had a lot of in the last couple of years, it's perfectly reasonable to appeal to put up as an alternative step-by-step -step changes, especially when there's no crisis and the situation can go on for a year or two with some small modifications, which is certainly the case with the tax code or health care or many such issues. And certainly when one is in semi-opposition, which I would say is the current situation for the next two years, when uh, conservatives perhaps control one branch of government and have some influence, and in one half of one branch of government have some influence in the other half on the Senate, and and uh, will be mostly struggling with the president, um, it would be fool. There's no need and really no purpose almost to for conservatives to do too much, to spend a huge amount of effort, I would say, in trying to implement cons what I would consider to be comprehensive conservative reforms. There's, it's very important to artic begin articulating them. But practically speaking, extending tax, the current tax rate for two years is a better solution than raising taxes. Uh, practically speaking, uh, get repealing various bad regulations of the sort uh, Chris mentioned, but much bigger ones too that the EPA is involved in, is a reasonable, practical thing to do for the economy and for the country as opposed to entirely reforming our regulatory framework or getting rid of the FCC or, or, or such things. Um, practically speaking, not creating new entitlements and and you know, chipping away at some current ones is a good thing to do for the next two years, as opposed to fundamental Paul Ryan-like reform uh, of the entitlement structure. Um, practically speaking, not printing more money would be a good thing to push the Fed to do, though I believe personally that you know two, three, four years from now there needs to be a real rethinking of, of, of fundamental monetary policy. Not that I'm an expert on that, and not that I'm certainly going to lead us into those depths. Um, you know, because the current system, I think, is, is fundamentally flawed. So I think step-by-step step can precede a certain kind of comprehensive rethinking of policies and of structures, monetary policy, entitlements, regulatory policy, tax policy. I mean, taxes is the most obvious idea. And I think, and I think this is happening. It's not, I'm not sort of saying anything fancy or speculative. In fact, conservatives are going to spend the next few weeks insisting on current tax rates. Um, they may spend the next session, this coming session of Congress, doing some minor things to improve some incentives for, for job creation and for growth. But fundamentally, in 2012, I would predict uh, the pres Republican presidential candidate will run on a pretty big, comprehensive, conservative tax reform. And I don't think that violates conservatism to have a big tax reform. I mean, you do have, there's going to be a tax code. It makes a lot of sense to think, you do have to think comprehensively, if that's the right word, or let's say from a from the point of view of the code as a whole, about what it encourages, what it, what, 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 what judgments it embodies, how it compares with the tax codes of other nations, what the relationship of federal and state is, all these big questions that come at the sort of more, you know, at the regime level, or at least at the big public policy level, let's say, as opposed to the step-by-step -step improvement in the current situation level. The step by, one should never minimize the importance of the step-by-step, -step, and most politics most of the time is and should be in a decent a regime like ours, step-by-step, -step, because, you know, most things are not crises and don't, and on the whole, the old advice of Aristotle that one should beware of, you know, lots of big changes because it has, well, they, they have unanticipated consequences, as neoconservatives pointed out years ago, but also that they just, it generally is just very disruptive to a sort of stable and reasonable political order that on the whole one doesn't want to be doing huge reforms every few years in large enough parts of American life. On the other hand, when one hits certain uh, watershed moments, and I think we're hitting them in a lot of areas, whether it's debt and deficit or the regulatory structure of the regulatory system, or I would say in certain areas of the financial, the financial structure, um, one does need to have a sort of big bigger um, framework for one's reform. And as I say, I think if one thinks of that reform as more 
reforming the rules of the road, a kind of institutional and structural reform. It's a, that, that's the kind of reforms conservatives should uh, favor. They are reforms that at their best then lay the groundwork for lots of incremental and step-by-step -step changes in the future to adjust to circumstances. They're the reforms that increase liberty, that don't tell people what to do, that create stable uh, structures that are friendly to people exercising their liberty, both economic liberty and other forms of, of personal liberty. I would say that's incidentally true in foreign policy. I don't think there's any contradiction here. The fact is, after 9-11, we did do lots of step-by-step -step things. In fact, we did mostly step-by-step -step things, quite reasonably, since you can't do everything at once. We also did some longer-term things. I actually think we probably erred on the side of not doing enough comprehensive and longer-term thinking about what the threat is and what our defense structure needs to be and what our intelligence structure needs to be. The problem with this so-called war on terror or the real war on terror isn't that we've done too much big thinking. It's that in a certain way, and understandably, given the incredible pressure we've been under and the need to deal with actual concrete threats, we've done a lot of concrete things, probably without stepping back and thinking is the how about the whole structure of the U.S. government? Is the are the intelligence agencies properly arranged? Are the you know the combination of diplomacy and military does that really make sense? Um, you know which are the bigger threats that need to be dealt with? When it's again it's understandable to put that off, but I would say in foreign policy as in domestic policy, the basic principle that one can combine step by step sensible reforms, either when one can't do more or one does doesn't need to do more, or when one is under such pressure that that one doesn't have the time to do more, with longer term uh, um, constitutional level almost uh, more comprehensive reforms is, is a, um, that's a manageable task. I think that is what conservatives need to do over the next two years. Is that what's impressive to me is that the Tea Party activists, I think, get this instinctively. They're very concerned about very precise things that have happened and they want Obamacare repealed and they want tax rates kept the same and they want various foolish things stopped. But they also understand that over the longer term, not just long term, but over the medium term, uh, we need to have more fundamental reforms in the modern welfare state because we are careening off a cliff for various reasons and all these sort of problems and disabilities and deficiencies of the modern welfare state have come to, many of them have come to a head in the last few years and it's much more evident that fundamental reform is needed. So I think conservatives can be for both step-by-step -step reform and fundamental reform. Thank you, Bill. In checker, thank you. The problem of comprehensive reform. Let's talk about education. Um, Fifteen uh, years ago, when we were editing this book, the outgoing 103rd Congress had just passed, and President Clinton had eagerly signed both the Goals 2000 Act and the Improving America's Schools Act, which was the umpteenth renewal of LBJ's Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Uh, let's acknowledge that both of those measures, radical as they seemed at the time, were also logical outgrowths of a mostly bipartisan sequence of education reform efforts dating back to a nation at risk in 1983 and to the 1989 Charlottesville Education Summit where President Bush Sr. and all the governors settled on an unprecedented set of national education goals. The 1994 legislation also owed more than a little to Bush's and Education Secretary Lamar Alexander's America 2000 plan of 1991, which was intended to give some traction to those national goals. It all seemed to make sense at the time, um, and uh, or, or so I thought. Uh, but I also noticed at the time and wrote in the book that these developments did further what we called the cult of governmentalism, and they did violate the principle of subsidiarity. They definitely tended to draw toward Washington the responsibility for school reform, the need for which was recognized by just about everyone, but the responsibility for which had theretofore been vested, Tenth Amendment style, in the states. It may seem like ancient history today, but it wasn't really all that long ago, at least not in geological terms, uh, that governors such as, of all people, Lamar Alexander, uh, Bill Clinton, Tommy Thompson, John Angler, Dick Riley, Tom Kane, were sending great big education reform waves crashing onto the beaches of their own states. After the 94 election, uh, two changes occurred on this front, and neither of them turned out well. Uh, from the right, mostly from Republicans, especially new House members, came a clamor to stop the world, we want to get off. The main symbol of that was the push to abolish the Department of Education. The intent, of course, was to roll back Washington's involvement in education and return control to states and districts and parents. The impulse was certainly understandable, but the specific proposal was purely symbolic and a little hollow. Uh, as I noted at the time, what matters is not the name over the door of the federal agency, but what goes on inside it. 
by way of spending and regulating and things like that without other sweeping changes abolishing the education department uh, then or now by the way would in effect recreate the old department of HEW which might not be a bad thing to do but it surely wouldn't restore state and local control of education the other and more consequential development after 94 was the move at first led by Democrats and resisted by Republicans but hold on a minute and we'll come back to that the move to tighten the screws of the new legislation and vest even greater authority in Washington. For it was evident, um, even by the mid-90s, that many states were not doing a good job of setting academic standards, developing good tests, or holding their schools accountable. And the 94 legislation didn't actually require them to do any of those things, though it set the stage for the federal government to monitor and evaluate and prod them. When many states uh, lagged on these fronts. As early as 1997, my own Fordham Institute was reporting on the, the crummy standards that most states were using for their schools. The cult of governmentalism kicked in big time and eyes turned to Washington to exert more leverage. The unexpected political development that followed was that this impulse became bipartisan during the 2000 election and soon thereafter George W. Bush and Ted Kennedy and other leaders from both sides of the aisle teamed up to give us no child left behind. President Bush sincerely believed that what had worked in Texas would work for the country and that enough leverage from Washington would cause this to happen. Some members of Congress agreed with him, others felt obligated to let him try. Uh, it didn't work out very well, however, and nine years later, one of the big challenges awaiting Lamar and his colleagues in the 112th Congress will be to try once again to set matters right. In my opinion, NCLB has done us a bit of good by making the performance of every school in the country more transparent, flagging the achievement gaps that plague us, attempting to boost everyone's achievement towards some notion of proficiency, trying both to intervene in failing schools and to give kids alternatives to bad schools. There have also been some minor achievement gains, mainly in math and almost entirely in the early grades. Nothing has changed by way of high school graduation or 12th grade achievement, and nothing much has changed in reading. You're well aware of the overriding problem, which isn't much different today, only worse than it was in 1983 at a nation of risk. American kids aren't learning enough. The next round of international comparisons, the PISA test, will be out on Tuesday. They're going to underscore this, um, and we're falling behind the rest of the world. Not because we're getting worse, but because we're essentially flat and other places are getting better. So the problem first identified in 1983 remains unsolved in 2010. No Child Left Behind has not solved it. Neither will tightening the screws further. We've had two decades of screw tightening, and what it's mainly done uh, is take control of the schools farther from those who actually run them, has narrowed the curriculum to little more than reading and math, has neglected kids who are already proficient in those subjects, has failed to deliver decent alternatives, has failed to turn around broken schools, and has encouraged states to set low standards so that more kids would appear to be proficient, and so that federal mandates would appear to be met without really meeting them. To give credit where it's due, I think it needs to be said that Arne Duncan and Barack Obama have tried to ease this problem using the instruments available to them, namely federal funding and regulation. Their blueprint for revamping NCLB has quite a lot of merit, and their race to the top was an earnest and I think partly successful attempt to induce states to make some, some worthy changes without forcing states to do so. But the heavy lifting lies ahead. Congress has so far avoided grappling with NCLB itself. The Duncan blueprint has gone nowhere, and everything I've heard, Lamar is inside and probably knows more, says that while there is a consensus about NCLB's failings, there's no agreement about how to fix it. Uh, one problem, and this comes to the question of comprehensiveness versus step-by-step, -step, is that NCLB ran to about a thousand pages and contains dozens and dozens of programs you've never heard of, most of which have nothing to do with education reform but all of which would need to be agreed about before a comprehensive reauthorization could move forward, which is, of course, a major reason that that hasn't happened and very likely why it can't happen. Meanwhile, a sort of pincer movement is evident between those who would still tighten the regulatory screws tighter, yes, I could name names, and those who simply want Uncle Sam to butt out and leave it to states and districts to run their own schools with no interference from Washington. I think both, fuels, both of those views are crazy. Tightening the screws clearly doesn't work, but Uncle Sam abandoning the field is a formula for dysfunctional school boards, greedy unions, and inept compliance-minded state education departments to take charge once again. Neither is a strategy for boosting educational achievement in the United States. Is there a way out, a sensible middle ground? There is certainly one to be described, and it is a step-by-step -step approach, actually. 
uh, and it partakes of something that Lamar has earlier talked about, uh, which is to uh, try, instead of a comprehensive reauthorization, to identify the major problems uh, that we face and see if we could solve just them uh, and, uh, um, and make things better. And I think that uh, uh, this could be done in the core Title I program where most of the money is and where most of the NCLB problems arise. Um, I think it involves doing five things, just very briefly. First, largely embrace the administration's blueprint to uh, abandon federal oversight of accountability for the vast majority of American schools. Kill adequate yearly progress. Hand the ball back to states to design accountability systems for their schools. But two, at the same time, insist on greater transparency of school results, pegged to high and comparable standards and rigorous assessments. There's a worthy uh, organic process underway in this country now uh, embraced at least on paper by 45 states to share common standards and to develop common assessments uh, without any federal uh, involvement something we've never done before in this country uh, this has great promise toward in the direction of transparency um, and uh, Congress can reasonably expect of states that they will make the performance of their schools transparent maybe use the national assessment as a benchmark for that Third, choose incentives over mandates. Rather than requiring states to develop things like prescriptive teacher evaluation systems, create a competitive grant program like the Teacher Incentive Fund that rewards those states that want to push this envelope. Fourth, consolidate uh, dollars from as many programs as possible into flexible funding streams. Put it out through the Title I formula, which is the best way to get dollars to the classroom with the fewest strings. It might cut down administrative overhead costs too. And it would also do some good to help cash strap states and districts at a time when I don't think we're going to have any more federal bailouts. And fifth and last, experiment with state performance contracts, something Lamar proposed a couple of years ago, by which states could negotiate broad waivers with the Secretary of Education to do things very differently. That's all. That's all that we need to do to start, but that's plenty. It respects the principle of subsidiarity. It repudiates, at least in part, the cult of governmentalism. It escapes, I think, the political pincer I mentioned a minute ago, and it might even do some good for our kids and our international competitiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Checker. Thank you all. To uh, Let me uh, maybe kick off this discussion, beginning with Senator Alexander's remarks. Uh, you include, Senator, an extremely promising agenda making it easier and cheaper to create jobs, for sure. But when you raise the question, comparing this moment, based on the election results last month, with, uh, with uh, what happened 15 years ago, you remind us that, like then, we're looking for an intellectual context uh, for this latest anti-Washington surge. I, I think Bill Crystal reminded us that, unlike 1994, I think the Tea Party, at least, activists have to some extent provided that. They are extremely serious about returning Washington to its proper constitutional limits. And I think that's extremely promising. Uh, what better intellectual context for what we all uh, would like to see happen? And it's certainly more of a b battle cry, a uh, rallying cry, than smaller steps, it seems to me. It's such an organizing. Uh, worthy principle. I wholly agree with Chris DeMuth. In fact, I propose beginning a list. Another revolution betrayed if the, inc the ban on incandescent light bulbs is not repealed. <laughs> oh, we should definitely keep this list. I have one I'd add. As you well know, in uh, modifying the forming student loan program, a very generous loan forgiveness is extended to graduates who go into public service. We ought to give a generous loan forgiveness to graduates who don't go into public service. <laughs> I, I, that's how dramatically I think we have to reorient how we feel about things. What, what's with the glorification of the public sector? Um, so that would be one of my tests. And I have a test for aspiring politicians. Just yesterday, the child nutrition bill passed the House, $4.5 billion a year. This is Washington, D.C., dictating what vending machines in grammar schools contain. 
Now, how the same people who talk about the importance of returning Washington to those constitutional limits think they ought to be dictating uh, what vending machines carry. You know, the premise that federal politicians somehow care more about the well-being of children than do state and local officials is really stunning. In any event, my, my test for an aspiring politician would be if you're preoccupied with what a fourth grader is having for lunch, don't run for federal office. <laughs> I mean, it's a worthy concern, but stay home and preoccupy yourself with what's being served in lunchrooms at home because it's not Washington's concern. So when we talk about cutting back spending and discretionary caps well overdue, is the argument going to be these are all extremely worthy programs and wholly legitimate for Washington to be running, but we just don't have the money to pay for them? Or are we going to gradually and incrementally articulate the new proposition? You know, we're not spending money on this because it's not Washington's concern. And wouldn't we be rebuilding trust in the federal government if they constrain themselves to their fundamental responsibilities, like maybe they do a better job? with respect to their fundamental responsibilities that they weren't trying to do way too much. So the question I'm going to quickly pose to our panel, and maybe they each have an example, is national problems with no appropriate federal solution. Because I think that's what the new Congress really ought to grapple with. Allow that there's no federal solution, even though it's an acknowledged national problem, and begin returning Washington to its, its proper limits. Can you identify for me national problems that don't have a federal solution because it's none of Washington's business? Sure. Um, safe schools, the um, ensuring children's safety in schools is, cannot be mandated or managed from Washington. The only useful thing Washington might do is require honest reporting of unsafe schools, but they can't be made safer unless you want to start deploying troops in them. Okay. Now, Chekhov, is that because Washington wouldn't do it very well? Or it's not a responsibility of Washington. Well, both. I mean, you could. I'm sure you could justify it under the general welfare clause if you were looking to. Um, but it's no. It's it's no appropriate responsibility of Washington, and it couldn't be done in a hundred thousand schools. And then the title of our of our overall gathering is is so crucial. Less from Washington, more of ourselves. The federal school lunch program and now breakfast program, and I guess in Washington D.C. dinner program are pretty close to being sacred cows, broad bipartisan support. And if we're going to ask more of ourselves, my question is, what poor excuse for a parent can't rustle up a bowl of cereal and a banana? I just don't get why millions of school children qualify for school breakfasts unless we have a major widespread problem with child neglect. You know, I mean, if that many parents are incapable of pulling together a bowl of cereal and a banana, then we have problems that are way bigger than the, that, that problem can't be solved with a school breakfast because we have parents who are just criminally, uh, criminally uh, negligent with respect to raising children. And yet, that's the kind of program that has huge bipartisan support with very little thought about why we're now feeding children. Talk about a parental, fundamental parental responsibility. In what sense can we begin asking the more of ourselves piece to go with this less government? Any ideas, Bill? <laughs> a, a, twist, a twist on your, um, your, your various comments on uh, regulating food consumption um, is obesity. I, I would say that obesity is a substantial national problem mm -hmm. uh, that the federal government should have nothing to do with. And I could imagine various little local initiatives that if I were on a town council, I mm -hmm. wouldn't object to. Uh, but uh, it is largely a cultural problem. And yet, there is a lot of talk about all sorts of federal 
some sort of a federal response to the, uh, you know, very real problem with obesity. Well, I think that's where I, I think that's where the more from ourselves uh, comes from. I mean, we, there there are any number of small groups uh, in America who are dealing with these problems in an adequate fashion, and uh, part the the debate is is so skewed in part because all you hear th there are only two sides: either you're for you know fighting these problems or against fighting these problems. Uh, I, I think the you know we need to articulate a solution, which is you know along these lines. These are problems worth fighting, and here are a dozen terrific examples around the country of folks who are undertake uh, who who are fighting these problems uh, in a successful fashion uh, without massive government legislation or without massive government uh, uh, regulation. This was what Lamar. I mean, you know, Lamar was looking at at uh, homeless shelters and training centers in, in uh, East L.A. for people who were uh, non-English speaking uh, originally and yet were being trained and getting jobs, good jobs at the time. I mean, the whole point of, of uh, Senator Alexander's, uh, you know, we know what to do, is that we do have those answers. Uh, and, and they are non-federal answers. But we need to become much more adept at the national level of, of sort of uh, diverting the conversation into those alternatives. You know, let's talk about uh, some of those local answers to the problems, uh, which come in an immense diversity. They are they're not you know legislated in a, in one comprehensive bill. Uh, they take an infinite variety of forms, but they all address the, the address the problem in a successful way. And what you know, one of the things that that uh, those of us who are uh, enthused about uh, Senator Alexander's campaign for the presidency uh, uh, those many years ago is because this was where he started. This was where this was where his politics was grounded. It was grounded in. Maryville, right? Uh, the, the Maryville Decor Declaration, which was his uh, announcement for the presidency and which uh, pointed to local wisdom as, as uh, a solution. I don't hear a lot of that from today's national politicians, and I do hope we see more of that as we... Well, let, let me say, I mean, I'm very much, I'm very sympathetic to Kate's notion that we don't, conservatives shouldn't just say, you know, we can't afford to do certain good things, that there are some things that the federal government uh, shouldn't do and, and shouldn't do for various reasons, some of them kind of almost pure constitutional delegation of power reasons, some of them the moral hazard of the federal government stepping in to do them. Often you don't know what would happen locally or at the state level until the federal government gets out. So I, don't, I think there are limits in a certain way. I mean, I'm all for Bill Schomburg's notion of promoting other good things that are happening in civil society or at the local level, but I don't think that should be a precondition for moving against some of the mistaken things the federal government should do. And I would, but my only slight maybe qualification, I'm not sure if this is really disagreement with Kate or not, but is I wouldn't reject, on the other hand, the pure economic and, and, and fiscal arguments either. I mean, as a practical matter, people don't know, I mean, it's hard to make the case against certain programs until they start bankrupting the country or until they're manifestly inefficient or manifestly counterproductive in their effects. I mean, it just is, this, people are set, People are more practical than, than than intellectuals would like to be, and people in think tanks would like them to be, perhaps, and they, they want to see that something is or isn't working. And in this respect, conservatives, I mean, it's bad for the country that we have a $1.3 trillion uh, de deficit and uh, God knows how many trillion dollars of debt and a lot of federal programs that pretty clearly aren't working, but it is good for conservatives to be able to say that this is at least a, a sort of prima facie evidence that we should reconsider that program. Plus, it turns out it has all kinds of other distortions in terms of swallowing the federal government, taking away from citizens' actions, uh, and the like. I mean, the Tea Party itself, let's just remember, what was the Tea Party? The Tea Party was ultimately resulted, two and a half years later, one might say, the spirit of the Tea Party resulted in a very great declaration of principle uh, in the Declaration of Independence, a war fought for certain principles, ultimately, quite a few years later, in a constitution that embodied a whole new structure of, of, uh, of Republican government. On the other hand, the actual proximate cause of the Tea Party and the reason they threw the tea in the water was as much was partly fiscal. It was partly a matter of self-government. It was partly that the British shouldn't be taxing the colonists. It was also that it was actually a, a, an oppressive tax and it was part of a uh, of a series. I don't remember the history in great detail, but part of a series of oppressive taxes. And weren't they called that actually? The uh, um, uh, I think the I think they were called at the time the, by the colonists the oppressive taxes and um, and uh, it was a practical sort of rebellion against 
heavy-handed government that was burdening colonists in a way that they didn't want to be burdened. Now, so I think the trick is turning the, let's say, the fiscal complaint into a more principled or constitutional complaint. Yeah. And I think some of that's happening, though. Again, I'm, I'm really heartened by the degree to which um, lots of the new candidates for office are moved partly by the sense that, oh, my God, we cannot have a $1.3 trillion deficit. I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, it's insane. We're going to go bankrupt and or the dollar is going to collapse or the whole system is going to break down but also by the sense that that is an indicator that something else went wrong. And when you start to think about what went wrong, you go backwards, so to speak, and backwards historically and sort of upwards intellectually, and you think more structurally about what's wrong with the whole modern uh, welfare state. Federalism, we were talking about this before the panel, Lamar and, and, and the panelists were discussing. I mean, I think for years, conservatives proposed various ways of sorting out the really perverse mix I know, the perverse kind of federalism we now have, which I think, I mean, Chuck knows infinitely more about this than I do in education, and Chris knows more about it in other areas, but, you know, has creates all kinds of perverse incentives. Federalism now creates more big government than checking big government, you know, because of the matching grants and the incentives to spend all the money you have coming to you, and then the way in which you then create a state structure which lobbies at the state level, parallel to the federal structure, the federal bureaucrats who level, and interest groups who level, lobby at the federal level. And this marble cake federalism, or whatever the political scientists call it these days, is really, I think, now somewhat pernicious, actually. And the idea that Reagan floated in 76, and that people talked about in the early Reagan administration, and Lamar talked about in the mid-90s, of set, sorting out certain functions and giving some functions cleanly to the states, and the federal government perhaps taking some other functions cleanly. You know, Medicaid would be an obvious case where this could be done, uh, maybe swapped for something. Um, would I think be a healthy development. I think it's both fiscally kind of necessary today, but it would also be a healthy development for self-government. It would have the federal government have a clearer sense of what its responsibilities are. The state's governments would be clear. The states could compete to do a better job in helping poor people have better access to health care. We'd learn much more from these state competitions. It would just be a much better, uh, a much better solution. And I think so. I think moving from the immediate crisis of, oh my God, Medicaid's bankrupting both the federal government and the state government, to a sorting out of responsibilities in a way that's structurally healthier for both our economy and our politics is is what conservatives have to think through. No, I I, I don't think we disagree at all, uh, Bill. The fiscal crisis does provide that opportunity, but when you made the point, which I think is right, that there's going to be an obligation or an opportunity over the next two years for the new majority in the House, the larger majority in the Senate, to articulate rather than implement, I think it's really important that they be articulating uh, this return to constitutional limits argument that I, I think certainly the most active parts of the, uh, of the Republican uh, base, but I think it resonates with others too, given the distrust of Washington, uh, how, what low regard Washington's held in. S and as self-governing people, you remind us about the Tea Party, self-governing people should not have their light bulbs taken away from them, <laughs> right? By people, the government is supposedly uh, uh, subservient to us, and it sure doesn't feel that way. And then now, and they've already took our toilets, mm. now our light bulbs. <laughs> They're going for our shower heads. <laughs> and as a good conservative, I say, get them back in the bedroom where they belong and out of the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> We're ready to take questions from the audience. We have time for a few. If you have somebody to direct it to, please let me know. There's a question up here in front. Yeah, I saw that. Oh, at the very end? You're touching. Uh, oh, and excuse me. Hold the microphone as close as you can, please. I'd like to ask a question about the Mad Hatter's Tea Party that you are describing, which takes place in these high levels of leadership in Washington. I'd like to ask you, one, if you think the entire culture in America has radically changed within the last 10 years that would support the concept of the federal government giving breakfast to children, the topic that you're starting. 
does it reflect a complete transformation of traditional American values in the era of Ralph Waldo Emerson, who is teaching people to be self-reliant? No, I, I, if I understand your question correctly, I don't think there's been any fundamental shift in the public's, uh, in the American public's typical belief in self-reliance and individual responsibility. I think we've had this sort of creeping, uh, taking charge of more and more aspects of our lives, and in a very destructive way, I think, uh, substituting government for what really belong um, to parents, or the responsibility of parents. You know, government just taking over more and more uh, prerogatives and, uh, and responsibilities from where it should rest with respect to children. I don't think that reflects a major change on the part of the American public, though. Just the kind of creeping big government we have. It seems to me, it's, can you hear okay? It seems to me there's an, some epistemological confusion about creating programs versus dismantling programs. When you create a big comprehensive program, you're sailing into the unknown. When you dismantle one, you're going back to status quo, which you know either worked or it didn't. So I think there's actually some danger in doing a lot of small things because people will be looking for um, significant change. And if, if it's not delivered in a couple of years, perhaps they feel like nothing's been done. Mm -hmm. Just I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Well, I would just I, I take the point to a degree, but I would also warn, I mean, obviously, if a big government program has been going for 30 or 70 years, there are settled expectations, settled investments that one has to be respectful of. And I don't, I've always, when I got involved in the education reform business, when I came here to work for Bill Bennett and with Checker in 1985, I got to know Lamar for that matter, I was sort of contemptuous of people who resisted school choice, uh, especially middle class families who had good schools who didn't see how, auto, how very, very important breaking up the monopoly, breaking up the power of the unions, breaking up the power of the, of the administrators, um, in, in, in introducing real competition would be, especially for the poor, poor students who were, not, who were getting such a bad deal in America. And then I, then I had kids and lived, you know, we, we actually sent our kids to public school and you start to think a little bit more intelligently and as a grown up about, well, look, people, you know, people have saved a lot of, a lot of people work very, very hard and saved a lot of money to go buy a house in a place that had a good public school system. And it's not fair to just have contempt for them when they say, wait a second. I mean, I, this is the way it's been set up for an awful long time. I went to an awful lot of effort to try to make sure my kids got a good education. It's nice for someone from a think tank here in Washington to say, hey, everyone would be better off if we had statewide school choice, which was a, one thing I was for at one point. Um, and, you know, you guys who resisted are just selfish, but there's something a little silly about that. And it's similar, I think, I would say with Social Security, where people, where Medicare, conservatives are a little too glib sometimes to simply assume that these programs are just, you know, that anyone who likes them is somehow selfish uh, or, you know, a parasite of the state. As if these things, these things have now existed a long time, and people have made investments and have lived lives based on certain expectations of them, and therefore the dismantling of them is sometimes complicated. I don't think the dismantling of the incandescent light bulb <laughs> regulation uh, or the defunding of NPR would be complicated. But I think, and Unless I mean, you work at NPR. Yeah, well, they could, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, every, you know, I could make some jokes about that, but I won't here, maybe. Um, but, I mean, obviously, these major programs do require thinking through, and that is why, I mean, obviously, when you t look at Paul Ryan or others who have tried to think through how one would reform health care, uh, they don't simply, they, they do try to think seriously about, okay, how, how do we get from the current system and from people's, the way people do now get health care, which after all is pretty good in a lot of ways in America, and a lot of longevity's up, but a lot of diseases are cured that didn't used to be cured. How do we get from here to there with sensible reforms without simply sort of pretending one could uh, roll back the clock and, 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 and do away with things that have developed? And of course, to be also to be fair, I mean, rolling back the clock isn't always such a good idea since things weren't so great in 19... You know, 35 or uh, or in 1965, perhaps even. And that is why the Obamacare debate is so critical, because its deployment is a 10-year program. Once it's deployed, people's expectations will be fundamentally changed, and the the possibility of getting to a much better system uh, is going to be severely compromised. 
the, I, I think that's why people's focus on Obamacare as, as one thing to think about comprehensively, uh, as uh, Omar Alexander uh, noted, is so important. One thing I think, uh, uh, Bill, you, you point to uh, quite sensibly, and that is that, you, you know, there are certain programs like Social Security and Medicare uh, that, uh, uh, you know, conservatives spent a lot of time in ammunition attacking over the years and uh, w with, with no success. And for the reason you suggest, which is that, you know, the American people have come to think of those uh, as uh, uh, programs in which they have personal accounts. Now, we all understand that that's a myth and all that stuff, but that doesn't change the fact that the man in the street thinks that, you know, it is his money or her money in Social Security and Medicare and so forth. And I think that was one of the interesting developments that began in, in 94 with this uh, focus on, on the new promise of American life. Uh, partly at the suggestion of Les Linkowski, who's a name that hasn't come up yet, who was president of Hudson at the time. He, he made the suggestion this would be a good target. Uh, you know, it's, it's, that, it's that comprehensive intellectual vision that we know what to do and that we, and this is a, a program that can be imposed on people who are otherwise uh, foolish and benighted. Uh, that suddenly became uh, the target of wrath, I think, from, from the 90s on, and, and certainly was the target of, of wrath in 2010. Uh, not so much the New Deal, you know, not so much some of the more pro popular programs of the Great Society, programs in which people had come to have uh, tangible personal stakes. Uh, so I, I think we've we've learned a lot about who the real bad guy is since since '94, and it is in fact this progressive vision going back to the to the beginning of the 20th century, much more so than FDR's New Deal. Let's say. I want to invite uh, Senator Alexander for some closing remarks. I would like to ask you to give the uh, the panel a hand for coming today and for their their remarks. The, you don't know how much of a treat this is for me because not only do I admire them and their various thoughts and attitudes, I've known them forever. <laughs> they are, I mean, Chris and Checker and I were on the Nixon White House staff in 1969. We were all in our 20s. They were working for Pat Monahan, I for Bryce Harlow, and as Bill said, uh, uh, we met in the 80s, and Bill Shambra and I worked together uh, in the 80s, and, and Kate is much younger, but she was, uh, uh, we've known each other for a good long time, too. So this has been a treat for me to hear what they said. If I could give like a three-minute uh, not a, a, a counter argument, but I, I made careful notes of what was said and I had these thoughts. On Kate's point, now are there parts of government that could be exchanged? I went to see President Reagan when I was governor. It was in 1981, and I proposed something Bill Crystal mentioned, which was, Mr. President, why don't you swap Medicaid for elementary and secondary education? and uh, shifted the spotlight from where the spotlight ought to be. So that was an example. That, a smaller example would be the Gun-Free School Zone Act of 1995, which I campaigned against. I mean, if there ever was an example of Washington sticking its nose into something, it, could, it just literally couldn't do, which was to make schools, the area around schools safe, as Checker said. Um, Bill Shamber, I've quoted him many times in speeches. He, he, he can be sure I will quote him more often now that he has said that Lamar was Tea Party before Tea Party was cool. That will become a <laughs> plaque. And, and, and I thank him for reminding me of the phrase arrogant empire, which I used to use a lot. And I thank him for reminding us of how much goes on in communities, how much really goes on in communities. We don't do most of what goes on in the United States here. It goes on in communities. Yet, for some reason, because of the way our media works, the spotlight is always in the wrong place. It's not on Sister Jenny, and it's not on the homeless shelter in Dallas, and it's 
not on Henry Delaney and Savannah. It's on something else. And we know better, but we watch this and we forget about Sister Jenny and Henry. And we know that they're, they're the places where things sort of work. Chris's point is exactly right about regulation. It's sort of overlooked as we talk about too much of this and too much of that. Chris, I voted against the Higher Education Act a couple of years ago because I stacked on the Senate floor all of the regulations that are have been promulgated by the Higher Education Act, and they made a stack taller than I am, and the new uh, reauthorization of the, of the Higher Education Act would make it twice as tall. Just, just, just that caused me to vote against it. I think the two-year budget is a very good antidote to, to it because it means every other year Congress could devote its attention to repeal, oversight, uh, deregulation, all those things instead of appropriations. Checker's point and Bill's point I'd like to conclude by commenting on. I mean, Checker gave the example of, of what do you do about education? Do you do, as I suggested, eliminate the Department of Education? I think most of us here have had about every position possible on this. I know that I have, and I think they have. <laughs> I mean, I have been for swap. I've been for eliminating the entire department. I've been the secretary of education. <laughs> so we're, you know, we're we're well experienced in all of the possible, all possible views on, on on this. But what do you do about no child left behind? I think what you do about it today, practically speaking, is fix it. You pick the four or five things and you fix it, because it might be good to repeal it. But but uh, we might spend two years making speeches about that. That's not going to happen. But we've got a pretty good chance of fixing it, and that might move us back in the direction of giving uh, communities more say over at local schools. And as and on Bill's point about comprehensive, you made me think of. Well, I first thought of all the number, you know, I criticized President Obama because all of his, and, and Bill Chamber said this too, so many of his advisors were schooled at elite universities where they think they're so smart they can come up with these comprehensive ideas so was our entire panel you know so <laughs> so that's a danger with all these smart people I think of the White House you know everybody's sitting around like they were at a Harvard Law Review meeting trying to show how smart everyone is and well, we can do this and we can do that and we can do this and we can do that of course they don't know anything about what's going on in Maryville or all these different places but maybe the point is uh, remember the billboard says think globally act locally well of course we're going to think comprehensively the Constitution is a comprehensive framework. Uh, if you're thinking of changing education policy, you have a comprehensive attitude toward what you do. If you're thinking about going to war, as the question was, you certainly have a comprehensive attitude. So, so I think perhaps we it, it would be enormously unwise for conservatives or any policymakers not to think not to think comprehensively about the framework of their actions. But my experience in the various things I've had a chance to do over the last 40 years, if you want to get something done, you're much more likely to fix No Child Left Behind than you are to abolish the Department of Education. Now, your comprehensive attitude might be the latter. But if you want to end two or three or four years with a result, it's probably going to be the former. This has been a fascinating opportunity for me. I thank the Hudson Institute, and I thank all of you for coming. Thank you. Yeah, it's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank all of you. Actually, was interesting, actually. I made some. I love it. Yes. Yes, so did I. Yeah, what the heck? What the heck? I'll claim it. I'll shock the C-SPAN audience, Chris. Who won't know I'm kidding? We can't fool each other very much. Yeah, I knew something about that. Is it this then? Yes, right. I've thought about that. I've had every position. They call it governmentalism, which is in the book. How are you, Abe? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And getting it done, I'm glad you mentioned last question. It was his idea. I should have said it. No, that's fine. That was terrific. Thank you so much. I'm going over to the Senate floor and make the speech. Right. Thank you for giving me that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, how are you? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, nice to see you. Yeah, Kate, thanks for doing this. I know you were sort of wondering. I was trying to